With me today is United Methodist activist and teacher, longtime leader, Ethel Johnson. I could not be more proud uh, to introduce my church uh, to a leader in our denomination uh, than Ethel Johnson. Ethel, I wonder if you would tell us just a few words about your story. Uh, where are you from? What was it like to be a black girl growing up when and where you grew up? I was born in um, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I was a twin. My twin sister died when we were not quite a year old. And um, our father left us when we were young. I had three older sisters. I had an older brother, but um, he died before I was born. And after our father left, um, our mother moved back to Stanton, Stanton, Virginia, which was her home. And so I grew up in Stanton in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, mm -hmm. beautiful country, mm -hmm. beautiful country. So I, I lived in a segregated city, went to an all-black school, all-black church, mixed with all-black people. Mm -hmm. And when did you come across white people, Ethel? Ooh, every day. Yeah. Yes, because to, to get from where we live to our church, and we were in church all the time, uh, we had to pass the white neighborhood. And, and so, and, and th there were white people who lived very close to where we lived. So, so I was in contact with white people all the time. So um, I didn't know them, they didn't know me, didn't necessarily like them, yeah. but you know, that's where we live. Ethel, one of the careers <laughs> that you have had is as a seminary teacher of Christian education, of church uh, administration. Um, what would you, what special gifts would you say you brought as a woman and as a black woman to how you taught and prepared seminary students for ministry? Uh, what, what, I, what I brought as a black woman was really what I learned as a child from my aunt because um, at five years old, my um, my uh, mother died, and her sister left her job to come and take care of the four of us. And she was a very wise woman who loved children. And she and I can remember her sayings to us because she used them all the time. Mm -hmm. But I learned from her that number one, God loves me. Mm -hmm. God loves me unconditionally and that I was no worse than anyone else. I was no, um, I was no um, better than anyone else, but I was unique. Mm -hmm and that there was no one else in the world just like me. And I should be proud of that and, and use that to the glory of your God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, and, so, and so that was drilled in me from the time I can remember. And it's just been with me all of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You also then had a career uh, along with that teaching in Africa, uh, at African University and in West Africa, where if, uh, if I'm not misunderstand, if, if I'm not uh, wrong, they call you the mother of the United Methodist <laughs> Church in much of Africa. How did that come about? How did you come to be uh, 
a, a oh, teacher in Africa, years. and and what has that meant to you? Well, now I had two different um, careers in Africa. <laughs> the first one was well, three different. Well, I don't know. Um, in '75, I went to Africa for, for the very first time. I had never dreamed of going to Africa, but I had the opportunity to go over and teach at the um, Bongo School of Theology in uh, Liberia mm -hmm. for a summer, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I cried when I set foot on African soil, mm -hmm. and everyone around me just looked just like me. Uh -huh. Oh, what a feeling it was. And the, then in 85, I decided, that, oh, and in 85, um, I had a sabbatical year. And so I went to Nigeria. Now I was invited to go to, to the South Pacific. To, um, to teach for a year. I had filled out all the papers that everything <laughs> was signed on my desk and a person from Africa happened to stop by my office. I was in the, at the time that he came and he saw the papers on my desk. Well, he had the business looking at him. That's he, right. <laughs> but he did. So when I came in, I didn't know him, he didn't know me. When I came in, he says, Professor Johnson, why are you going to um, America some more to teach when we need you so badly in Africa? Mm -hmm. I said, they invited me, you didn't. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the next morning I received this call from the Africa of of the um, of the um, General Board of Global Ministries and they said that the church in Nigeria was trying to become a part of the United Methodist Church. This was 85. Now, the EUBs and the Methodists had merged in 68. But the church in, in Nigeria had a struggle within itself. So they, they didn't even know that there was, that, that there had been a, um, Merger, and so they weren't even on board. Mm -hmm. Well, since I taught um, church administration, they said, you know, I was the ideal person to go help them to to, to, to organize. And I'm always I'm always look, looking for new adventures. Mm -hmm. and I said, sure, I'll go. But I thought, oh gosh, what do I do with the seminary in in um, America, Samoa? So I wrote and told him I wasn't coming, which of course wasn't a very good thing. Mm -hmm. But but I just felt I felt called to, to, to go to Africa, and so. Um, I went and, and, and I worked with the two factions of the church they had worked in together, trained them in what the United Methodist Church was all about. And this is where my work with women came in. Because at that time, everything was male. Yeah. The no women, I mean, they were out there, you know, uh, cooking meals and that kind of thing. But, but as far as the top leadership in the church, there were no women. And women would sneak around <laughs> and say to me, Professor Johnson, 
I really feel called by God. I said, well, you know, answer the call. But well, I can't do it here. I said, well, sure you can. So that I would say to, to the um, men, and, and there were no women leaders in any um, top, or any top level in the church. And I'd say, uh, you know, if you want to be a part of the United Methodist Church, you have to begin accepting women. We can't test that man's job, blah, 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 blah. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I said, you know, let's just get this straight down. If you want to be a part of the United Methodist Church, we have women district superintendents. We just elected a woman bishop. Because that was in 85, and we had elected uh, Marjorie Matthews yep. in 84. And and so uh, and, and so uh, I would work work with them, train them for a whole year, and then I went back every year after that to attend their annual conference. I would go early so that I could help them to 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 prepare for annual conference, and then I would stay after annual conference so so that. You know, I help, help them to see exactly where do they go, what, what was the next step. Yeah. So I, I did, did that from 85, oh gosh, so 90 something. And uh, they became a full stage conference in 1992. And they elected their own bishop. Yeah. So that was really good. And the first woman was ordained soon after they became an annual conference. And, and now, you know, they have women just as superintendents yep. and everything. Because you told them they had to. And that's right. <laughs> I said, no, I, know. I said, you know, this is a choice. You want to be a member? If you remember, you have to accept this. Yeah. If you don't want to accept this, I can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm walking away. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Ethel, you were, uh, I have read that you are one of the founders of Black Methodists for Church Renewal, uh, a renewal uh, and yes. justice organization within the United Methodist mm -hmm. Church. Mm -hmm. um, why did that seem necessary to you, and why is it still necessary? What happened was that, you know, in 1939, the church was split. There was the Methodist and Episcopal Church South, Methodist and Episcopal Church in the North, and they moved all black churches into what was called the um, central jurisdiction. Yeah. Now we are the only Protestant denomination that I know of that built in legally a segregated structure. Yeah. And that structure stayed until 1970. It was, it was in 1967. And, and so, um, in 1956, the Methodist Church and the Evangelical Church and the United Brethren Church had started talking about merger and they decided that, that the merger would take place in 68. Well, they went through very careful steps. They called it the 12 year plan to make sure that the people in the 
in the EUB church were protected and they had equal representation in everything. Well, they hadn't done that for the um, central jurisdiction, mm -hmm. which they were going to dissolve because we had said, you know, you can't invite a, another church in and you have this segregated jurisdiction which you shouldn't have had in the first place. But they had no 12-year plan they, to make sure that African-American members were represented. And so we decided that we needed to just get together and develop our own plan. Mm -hmm. and, and so our, the reason for BMCR was to hold the New United Methodist Church responsible mm -hmm. for the care of all of its members and not for some while you're kind of throwing others to the side. So that's what happened. I hear you. And it's just as important today as it was then. And, uh, I, uh, and I feel very sad as I say this, because it shouldn't be, yeah. you know? It, it shouldn't be at all. But it is. Yeah. yeah. Ethel, yeah. I wonder if you have a, a message or a word that you would like to share with women, and I'm thinking in particular of young women in the church today. My message for young women in the church, and it doesn't matter what uh, race or nationality, but for young women, period, who, who are a part of the church, I say, be yourself. Mm. Live close to God. Let God guide your life. And I hope there will be adults in the church who will nurture young people. Because you see, you have to have the, the understanding, the feeling within yourself that Yes, you are important just as you are, mm -hmm. and and that it and that you can do anything that you feel God is calling you to do, and the, the, and uh, that if you are uh, if you're doing it all by yourself. That's okay because you, you are never alone. Yeah. God is with you. Amen. And that's why it is Christian education is so important because you start helping children to not only learn this in their heads, but learn it in their hearts when they are very, very young. Because you see, God has given to each of us a mind that we wish to think and reason. And the three-year-old has a mind just like a 53-year-old does. And all you have to do is provide an opportunity for that person to use her mind. Mm -hmm. And so often in church, we don't accept the fact that children have a mind we uh -huh. to think and be We want to tell them what to do in our homes. So often we are doing the same thing. Yeah. And that is not the way we are supposed to live together. We live in community. We are all created equal. And so our most important thing is to learn how to work together. Amen. And you can only do that 
if you really feel within yourself that this is what God is calling you to do and pray about it. Take time to spend time with God. Uh, what, time, what time of day you choose to do it, but you have to spend time with God each and every day so that you know you have that peace within yourself that what you are doing, God is right there with you. I knew you'd start preaching if we gave you long enough. <laughs> I want to ask you this. You may choose not to answer this, but I'm, I'm going to be bold enough to ask you. Do you have a word or a message for white people in the United Methodist Church right now? Yes. When you look at me, I want you to see me as a black woman and see my color. Mm -hmm. I hate it when someone says to me, I don't believe you. Yeah. Look when you look black. I am black. Look at me as black. When you see me, you see a black face and, and accept my blackness. But that's number one. Number two, let me reach out to me in a way in which I can feel that you are doing it because you want to relate to me and not because you feel sorry for me or you feel you have to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, that this is the proper thing to do. Because, you know, we, we can feel when you are sincere and when you are not. And, and so, you know, God created all of us and create all of us with the same very, very basic qualities. And, and so with the therefore, I can do anything that you can do if I have the training you know, don't put me down and don't put me in a category. And the discipline, I'm saying, just the, just, the, just the, And talk to me about race. Some people say, oh, I don't want to offend you. Offend me. <laughs> yeah. You know? Because I will talk back to you. <laughs> you <know. laughs> I expect you can take care of yourself. Oh yes, oh yes, yes. So with these years, I have learned. But but the thing is, just to realize that we are all a part of God's family, and we are all equal in the eyes of God. And God doesn't play favorites, and God didn't make any junk. Mm. You know. So this is, and white people need to get to know black people. Mm -hmm. Now I am the only black person living in this building. Is that right? I am the only one. And it's very interesting as I move through the halls and participate here, uh, those people who kind of look at me with a kind of, uh, uh oh, uh -oh. Uh, half eye. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, not really looking, uh -huh. not that really looking at me and recognizing me, but just sort of moving on. And then those people who, with, with whom I can become engaged. And, um, but, but you know, as an African American, I have learned that I've just got to have this guts and the power of God to move and do what I need to do irregardless of other people. And sometimes it is a lonely existence, sometimes it's very painful, but, 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 but you know, you know you are never alone. You are never alone. 
Ethel, is there a particular scripture that you live out of? Oh, yes. The scripture is Romans 8, I think it's 38, 39. There is nothing mm -hmm. that can save us, that can separate me from the love of God. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And let me tell you, I have leaned on that scripture, especially working with the people in Nigeria who were fighting with each other. And here I come in as an, ins uh, as an outsider and a woman outsider <laughs> at that. Uh -huh. Oh my gosh, you know, I kept thinking, God, you brought me here, you've got to take care of me. And you've got to show me, let me feel within what my next step ought to be. Yet there is nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate me. Yes, that has carried me all these years. Yes. Ethel, in conclusion, would you pray for the people of Bethel International Church? Oh, yes. That's pray. I have known Bethel International Church, you know, through the years of struggle. Yeah. And, 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 and I am excited about who you are and what you have become. So I am happy to pray. Let's pray. Let us pray. Creator God, we are all your children. You breathe into each and every one of us the breath of life. I lift up the congregation of this church. I've known it through the years and all the changes that it has been through. And God, you have been there. You have been there all along. Guiding, nudging, sometimes they listen, sometimes they didn't. But, but you take slowly, slowly, slowly loving, guiding, and leading them. I give thanks that so many of them have been open to your being and have changed. This church has changed tremendously. I've seen the change in it through the years. For this, I give you thanks. And oh God, there is a great big future out ahead. And I pray that under Glenn's leadership and under the leadership of the officers of this church, that they will continue to lean heavily upon you, heavily upon you for what their next steps will be. They have come a long way. They have a long way to go. Hold them tightly in your arms. Hold them tightly in your arms and don't let them go as they continue to serve you in this part of your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ who showed us the way, I ask these things. Amen.